What's up, guys? My name is Nick Bell, your Line 6 product specialist for the day. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, so we got a summer NAM happening this week, so we may not have as many product specialists in the queue today as we normally do, but we're going to have some fun today. So taking a look here, who do we have? Uh, Ross Bailey, there you are. Thank you for joining us today, and Sagar, thank you so much. So guys, uh, we're going to be covering PodGo today. I'm taking a quick look at my little overhead that I have here at Podgo Wireless, and um, what we're going to be covering today is going to be a tone st uh, our tone stack options. Now, for many of us who have been, you know, maybe a Helix user um, or a Pod user, you know, for the past, you know, anywhere from seven to ten plus years, um, you know, these parameters may be new or may be uh, familiar to us, but. For the more newer players, um, you know, there may be, um, you know, some items here with questions because what really fuels these kind of learning with line six uh, seminars that we're doing are the questions we normally get from customers. And um, when we do our Skype lessons and stuff like that, and if you're curious about Skype lessons where you could have a one-on-one -on -one with us anytime, um, feel free to ask in, in the queue. I'll be able to send over a link and um, you know get you to sign up with one of those. And you could be with me or Ross Bailey or Tony Campanovo. And uh, we'll be happy to get you going on anything uh, Line 6, being Helix or Podgo. Now, although these are the uh, topics I'm going to be covering today, they're really just a placeholder, um, a placeholder for conversation and for me to dive into some things. But, um, you know, one of the main reasons I'm here as well is to answer any questions you may have. So any questions you have in regards to PodGo or even Helix, because PodGo features say, the same HX modeling found in, he, um, found in Helix, feel free to just, you know, hit me up with one of those questions and either me or another product specialist will be able to help you out. So, like I said, we're going to be covering the tone stack today. I'm taking a look at my slide here. The tone stack represents the knobs you would see on the real amps panel. So, what's really cool when you change from amp to amp, you'll notice that the parameters change to, you know, coincide with that amp model. Now, on a Marshall Plexi, normally, you know, it would be labeled as preamp or volume, but for our modeling, we call it drive, right? So, there are a couple little things that we call a little, that we name differently, and we add extra controls here and there. But at the end of the day, it's the exact same controls you would find on that amp. So let's take a look here. We're already getting some questions. Oh, Ronnie Bell, great last name, by the way. Uh, can the HX stomp looper be operated via MIDI? Yes, it can. Um, if you check out the, uh, the manual for your HX stomp, if you go towards the end of uh, the manual, you'll notice or you'll actually see uh, kind of a map where um, it has all the MIDI CCs. So just take a look at that and whatever MIDI controller you have, program those MIDI CCs and those values, and you'll be able to control almost any aspect of your HX stomp via MIDI. So Beats and Guitars, thank you so much for that question. So let's uh, dive on in what we're going to be covering today. Um, so like I said, the tone stack represents the knobs you would see on a real amps panel and what does an amp mean? You know, what, what makes up an amp? Well, an amp is essentially two parts. You have your preamp and the power amp. Now the preamp, that's responsible for your pre-gain um, in, you know, really, uh, you know, half the voice of the amp is, you know, where, where this is coming from. So the preamp, that's where our pre-gain, our distortion is coming from as well as the EQ stack with bass, mids, and treble. And then the most important part of the whole amp is the power amp. This is what pushes your sound out of your speakers. Now, a parameter um, that you will see in your, tone, in your tone stack being presence, this is actually a parameter speaking directly to the power amp, um, you know, which controls the amount of high frequency response we're getting from the power amp. And really its number one job is its overall output volume to the speaker. So the first, uh, the first parameter I'd like to talk about would be drive. Now drive, um, this is your gain or your preamp. Like I said, if we are to look at a, uh, you know, a Marshall Plexi, you, only, you have a volume one and a volume two. It wasn't called drive. Um, later on with uh, the Marshall JMPs in the you know, mid to late 70s, which then turned into the JCM 800, uh, that, that was the, the drive was labeled as preamp. So, in HX modeling world, we don't call it preamp or volume one or volume two, we call it drive, right? And I'll show you a couple different amp models on how that can change. So our drive is going to be responsible for controlling overall gain. 
Um, higher volume or higher value causes the preamp to work harder, resulting in a more distorted tone. So we're going to check that out. And then next is the master volume. Now I'm going to talk about master volume and channel volume because we've actually had I've actually had even many questions on preset leveling. Yeah, you know I have the channel volume, I have the master volume. What is the best to go after and use now? Let's talk about that in detail. So the master volume adjusts how hard the power amp is working. So the master volume parameter is actually what we call a field control. But at the end of the day, this is actually um, a true amp parameter where if you have a lower value, you're going to have less power amp saturation. Whereas a higher value equals a more power amp saturation. And I'll show you a couple differences there as well. Now, I've had users where they've leveled their presets using the master volume, and you'll notice that if you do that, you're going to be losing a lot of oomph, you know, a, a lot of the saturation and even the gain is going to be diminished because this is literally attached, you know, controlling the power amp. And so that's why there's a tonal difference. Now, when you look at the channel volume, this is literally just a volume control for the amp block. Think of it as like a channel strip um, volume control, uh, you know, on a mixing board, let's say. This has, this aff doesn't affect the amp's tone at all. And this is what you would use for preset leveling. And so when you're building your sounds, take a, you know, take a look at where you like your master volume some amp models we have like you know the the brit the brit plexis and um you know even the class a's the master volume is usually dimed at 10 um just because in the real world you don't have a master volume on a plexi you have just the you know just the volume or preamp control if you will so when you look at the volume control uh, the volume knob on you know a 60s or early 70s plexi um, that's essentially just controlling how much output that the power or that the preamp is producing. So keep that in mind when you are preset leveling. So I believe that's the end there. So let's just take a look at what I got going on here. So this is uh, my PodGo, the overhead here, but I'm just going to switch on over to uh, PodGo Edit. And this way we can see some things in detail. And I'm just going to move some stuff around here. Like I said, guys, um, today it's more of like a placeholder on you know the, the topics we're covering. So if there's any questions you have, please let us know. So I have uh, my uh, what I call my brown preset. <laughs> Very cool sound. Very responsive. So taking a look at what I have here, I have the drive maxed out at 10. I have the master volume maxed out at 10. What I'm using for my overdrive is the uh, LA Studio Comp. And the only setting I did here was just raise the gain to about seven. But if I were to turn this off, you know, we could hear a little bit more low end um, and just a little more natural gain and natural tone from the amp. So, and then also just to note, the cap that I'm using today is an impulse response. Um, this is actually available on our marketplace called LRS, or Live Ready Sound. This is actually a model of a Vintage 30, um, a 412 uh, Vintage 30 setup with a 57. And so I think that's a pretty cool sound, but as you can see, I have a couple differences, um, different uh, LRS uh, impulse responses in conjunction with the free alert pack. So if you're new to impulse responses and maybe you're a little hesitant on purchasing a pack, although I you know, definitely um, recommend you, know, you give some a try because they're very fun and take um, you know, a lot of the work out of the equation. You know, it's like, do you want to make burgers at home or you know, go out to a nice restaurant where it's already done for you? That's how I kind of think of impulse responses. And so um, if you're new, like I was saying, if you're a little hesitant to purchase one, check out the alert pack. You could go to line6.com forward slash alert and download um, these free six free impulse responses that are really every flavor um, you would need and I use them a lot um, I'm pretty surprised at how great they are and like I said they're free so today like I said I'm using that LRS vintage 30 I have a couple different versions there but this one works out pretty well and so 
first off, we're talking about the drive parameter. Now, like I said in the beginning, if we've been you know, using modeling for a while and, and we're familiar with amps and effects and such, this is going to be straight up review. But for those of us who are in the stream that are new, maybe you just purchased a PodGo or maybe you're thinking about you know, just moving over to modeling and you're not that comfortable with amps, well then this will give you a great head start. So like I said, the drive parameter is the preamp. This is how it really determines how hard your preamp is working. And so at higher values, the preamp's working really hard. At lower values, the preamp isn't working as hard. <laughs> could crank this value, um, this drive up even more. But keep in mind, HX modeling is so good that I could even crank this up higher and I could use my volume knob even to kind of clean up my sound. So you can kind of get that single coil. Go to the next. Just slowly crank up that volume knob. Clean it up again. And so the modeling right off the bat is very responsive. So keep in mind whenever you're writing a tone or you're thinking, well, you know, I start off really distorted and then as I get halfway into it, I need to clean up a bit. Um, you know, maybe I could just use my volume knob, but what's also great, um, you know, we could also just move around this drive and create a couple presets if you want. So very straightforward. Um, that's what our drive is going to do. And so, very simple, very straightforward. So that's where my drive's at. Maybe I'll just keep it at about nine and we'll leave it there. Now, the one, per, the two parameters that I've gotten, you know, the mo, you know, a lot of questions on surprisingly for the amp block is the channel volume or the master volume. Which one should I use when it comes to preset leveling? Now, obviously the channel volume, like I said, is just a volume strip. It's not going to affect the tone of the amp at all. So here we have the channel volume strip at uh, you know 7.5. I could turn it down to about five, and you know it's the exact same tone but quieter. And then I could you know kind of get us back to about six or so. Don't want to clip us. So as you can see, this is what I would use. Um, this is what I would use for preset leveling. And so keep that in mind when you're setting up your presets, don't go after the master volume. Of course, we can always go to the output block and control the level there as well. Um, you know, but it's just nice having everything in one block. I've seen many different styles when it comes to preset leveling, such as using the output block, but I recommend using the channel volume strip um, in the amp really use the output block as kind of a, you know, kind of a, you know, last case scenario um, where, you know, maybe you have your amp, maybe you have your amp model dimed and for some reason, if that's not enough volume for you, you could always use the output block. But let's just keep everything simple in one block. We'll use our channel volume as the overall volume control when it comes to preset leveling. Um, if you have any questions on preset leveling, you know, feel free to ask. Um, I did about two weeks ago a segment on preset leveling, so that's available on our Line 6 Facebook page that you can check out and so on. And if you were tuned in last week, Tony actually covered field controls. Now, the field controls are all the power amp controls here. If we have any questions on those, feel free to ask or even check out Tony's video from last week. Now, taking a look here at the master volume control, like I said, the master volume determines how hard the power amp pushes. Now, when I turn the master volume down, yes, the volume is going to drop. It is a master volume, right? Um, so it is definitely going to affect volume, but you're going to notice that a max volume, or max value, you know, I'll, I'll move the channel volume around a bit just so our volume isn't jumping around because I really want you to focus on the tone. And here are the differences here. So right now we have a decent volume level and master is at 10. You know, very dis you know distorted. It's you know it's it, you know it's a it's a rock tone, right? So 
So now what happens if we go from 10 to 5 and then I'm going to raise the channel volume to make up for that loss of volume. Now let's hear what we have. <laughs> So I didn't move the drive around. I haven't turned you know any effects on or off, but the tone is completely different. You know, now I could roll up to the neck pickup and just kind of play some you know maybe some expensive chord. And the tone definitely cleaned up. We'll go back to humbucker on the bridge. And what happens if I turn that master volume down now to about four, uh, three and a half, four, I'm going to raise the channel volume up as much as I drop the master to make up for that loss. And now I have an even cleaner sounding mark. So when you think about the tone that you're going for, it, it, it could be a pretty complex idea where you want the sound of a Marshall or a sound of a Mesa Boogie or Fender, whatever that may be, but maybe there's too much gain. And if you roll down the drive, you're losing um, that, you know, that characteristic and overall um, feel of that amp. Go towards the master volume and move that around. And we can hear a huge difference, you know, by kind of cranking that down to about 1.5 and then I'll move the channel volume up. And now there's less power amp saturation and the amp almost sounds, a, you know, a little, a, you know, more brittle, if you ask me. And then crank it up to 10, stop messing around. <laughs> I love that. All right. So now we're back at 10 and we'll put this down back to about 10. Not a bad sound. So that's what we get from these different parameters, especially the master volume. So keep that in mind, like I said, everyone, use the channel volume um, to, to you know do your preset leveling. And don't be afraid to move that master volume around because you definitely get some cool different sounds. Now, let's change our amp. Um, let's look at something like at a 50, like a PV5150. So we'll go over to this uh, PV Panama, and then you're gonna notice that the preset for the amp um, is at 4%, um, four out of 10. And so since this is a high gain type of amplifier, the, loud, the more I crank up that master volume, the more, obviously the more uh, power amp saturation we're going to get, but it may be liked more by some, or it may be disliked by some. Um, for me, I don't like really cranking the master volume up to a high level with these types of amps um, just because of that saturation. So let's see where we're at in regards to level. Don't want to blow us away. And so I'll crank that volume up to about 8.5. We could go a little more than that. Let's about, what about now? That's a great sound. Yeah, that's a great pair with that LRS uh, input. Just getting a little getting a little lost there so as we can see not a bad sound i'm even going to give us a little more of a volume boot so what happens if i put this master volume even lower than four so if we go from four to two you know the amp still holds its composure pretty well and the drive is only you know right below four So there's definitely a bit more clarity there. Now, we start off at four, but how does it sound if we end up at around maybe seven, and I'm gonna drop the channel volume just so we're not blowing ourselves away. Let's give ourselves a quick check. So now, the master volume went from four to seven, and let's hear our sound. It's starting to 
starting to sound a little cluttered. All right, let's see. Uh, I got a question here from Ivan Nick. See, you don't. See, so you don't the low and high cuts in the IR block. Do you do them later, or do you, or do you not feel the need to manipulate them the way you would with a stock cab? So, Ivan, great question. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put these back to normal. These settings here, just so we can have some fun here. And so. Actually, let's take a look over at the IR block and we can see that my low cut is about 40 hertz. Now, that's a great question because every IR is different. Um, there's going to be a different low end response. Now, for me, I never really touch the high cut. Um, it's usually the low cut and I will adjust the low cut anywhere from 40 to 120 hertz. Um, you are removing anywhere from 40 to 120 hertz depending on the impulse response. So this one, um, before your question here, Ivan, is, you know, do I do it before? Do I do it later? Um, it's kind of one of those things where I automatically will pull up the IR and I'll hear the low and bass response. Now, I don't know how well this is going to translate over to the viewers listening over, you know, Internet on a phone or a, com or a computer. But, um, you know, especially with this kind of a sound, if I was to do something kind of in the low register. The low end kind of has a, um, you know, kind of a na could have a bit of a nasally kind of a honky type of a sound. So let's uh, remove about 80 hertz. And they, that, that sounds a lot better already. You know, if I was to remove even more, um, 120, that's probably a bit too much for this sound. Now I've lost all my low. So that's why for this, for my feel, I feel that 80 isn't too bad. That's just probably as high as I'd go. If you're looking for that really, really tight response. So let's hear that again, and then we'll turn off the high cut, or low cut. Now let's turn that low cut all the way down. So definitely makes a huge difference. So really to answer your question, after I pull up the amp and the IR block, I'll just immediately kind of move the amp move the EQ on the amp usually how I do with most amps um you know I'll move the bass treble around and honestly how the preamp how the how the effect blocks or the amp blocks are with their use with their uh, model defaults they're pretty on the money I'll just move the bass around a bit I love a lot of bass response mids I always kind of have you know lower than my uh, bass and treble and presence it really depends on the amp right so I'll kind of move that around and I'll get a feel for the sound. Okay, very cool. I'm hearing a little bit of um, of a difference in in the low end because I moved the bass up on the amp, let's say. And so then, yes, I'll go over to the low and the high. End. It's a lot tighter. Now, I always go after the low cut, and I'll move the high cut around. I'll utilize these parameters before I'll ever put on an EQ. For me, an EQ is kind of, it's like a last resort. It's a, the last needed item for me. Now, if I was building a Metallica preset and doing some James Hetfield stuff, then an EQ would be nece very necessary because when you think of his, what, what his uh, Mark II C Plus, he was using it, had um, an onboard e EQ, and he would just alleviate 750 hertz, right? So if I was building that kind of, of a tone, I would definitely already have a, you know, EQ in the mix, you know, that would just be right off the bat. Um, but for my kind of a sound and what I like doing, um, I tend to... I, I, I tend to get what I need just by moving the low and high cut around, but um, really to answer your question, Ivan, uh, um, Ivan definitely. Um, I definitely utilize these, and like I said, for my sound and the things that I do, I don't mess around with the high cut because it, for me it always sounds okay, um, but the low cut is always going to be at least 40 hertz up to 120. It all depends on the mics being used, the cabs being used. 
And even with stock cabs, um, you know, what I've loved doing in Podgo or even in Helix where you could have two of the same cab, but you're using a 57 or a, a 57 and maybe a ribbon mic at the same time so you can get the best of both worlds with the highs and the lows, you know, you can move around that low cut in for the, you know, for like the ribbon mic, like using a Royer 4038 an amazing sounding mic, um, but there's a lot of low end. So to make it usable, you kind of have to utilize that low cut. But like I said, um, you know, an EQ isn't going to make magically make your preset sound amazing. Um, it, it should be one of those things as needed. Well, I did everything on the tone stack. I did everything with my cab and I'm still getting a frequency I'm not in favor of. Then I'll throw an EQ on and find that frequency I don't like and then remove it. And so that's something that you can you know, get pretty far with using a parametric EQ. Um, because with the parametric EQ, you could find what, frequ like what low frequency you don't like, you know, fine tune it a bit and then grab the gain and, 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 and alleviate it, you know, remove it out of the mix. Um, you know, there's always a bunch of different styles, you know, nothing is wrong. It's all what sounds good to you. But if you're looking to kind of clean up a sound, find the frequency you don't like and remove it as opposed to, well, this frequency is there, you know, that this low frequency I'm not in favor of. So let me crank up my high end frequencies to kind of even it out. You know, you know, that is a different style, but definitely find the, the frequencies you don't like and remove those. Let's take a quick glance at the questions and see what we got going on. Thanks, got it, definitely a difference. Ivan, thank you so much for the great question. So Constantine, is, um, is Pago have sound differences with Helix or is this the same quality as Helix? So what we have in Podgo, um, Podgo features the same exact HX modeling um, found in the Helix family of processors. So the one difference here with Podgo, um, because when you look at Podgo and even um, an HX Stomp, they're similar in price. So you may ask yourself, well, which one, you know, wh which one's right for me? Now, obviously the modeling is exactly the same, but what you'll notice is we only have one path. Um, I'm not able to do parallel paths or split paths, if you will. So that means I can't run two amps at the same time. Um, that also means I can't run my delay and reverbs on their own separate path like we can with, um, you know, with Helix. And so, although it's the exact same model offering, um, it, the same model set, you may hear presets using the same blocks, but they may, it may sound a little different because maybe we're using more than one amp or even the reverb and, or another effect is on a parallel path. So you're getting a wet and a dry kind of a setup. Um, but the difference overall with something like uh, PodGo is that it's incredibly easy to use. And so if I just go to a blank preset, um, I have these prefix categories. And so we have our volume, our express, our, uh, our wah wah, um, our amp, our cabin, and EQ. These are present in every single preset. I can move them anywhere in the, in, in the uh, signal chain I want. I can change the model to whatever I want. The same goes for the volume. I can make a gain or a pan. I could even go to the wah wah and change the wah wah. And I can move anything around in the signal chain. But the kind of guesswork is already done for me, especially someone who is a little newer to tone building, maybe someone where it's, man, I've been using a Marshall and an Overdrive for the past 20 years, and now they have a pod go and they have everything under the sun. So this makes it very simple in a quick way to just, you know, just start building. Well, there's my amp. All right, I'll just choose, you know, I'll just choose an amp that I like. Maybe it's, um, you know, divided by 13. And then, all right, now, you know, the cab, you know, is automatically selected. And so you just kind of fill in the blanks here. Well, maybe I'll get a, you know, a tube screamer, you know, maybe I'll put a nice uh, spring reverb at the end. And, you know, I just go there and add a spring reverb. And what's even cooler is, you know, now those effects are automatically assigned to these uh, pre uh, to these uh, foot switches. And lastly, we have the effects loop. And so Podgo has an effects loop, um, a stereo effects loop equipped so if you have an effect you just can't live without you just plug that in to your pod go through the effects loop and then you can actually turn that effects loop on and off with the effects loop uh, foot switch here and if i want to swap assignments i could do that as well so sorry to go off on a tangent on pod go but i just wanted to show you that although pod go features the exact same model set and the same modeling technology as helix devices 
its layout is a bit different. And again, with a, with Podgo, you have a nice expression pedal. In Podgo Wireless, you're able to go wireless as well, which I've been doing through um, our whole presentation, just you know, using my G10T2 transmitter, which I can you know, plug in, sync, charge as well. And so that's the overall difference there. So thanks, Constantine, much appreciated. So guys, it looks like um, we are past the, uh, past the half hour mark at 1131. And so let's just take a look at some questions we have here because I've been having such a, you know, such a fun time with you guys. So how do I assign the expression pedal to the whammy? Well, let's take a look at that. So if we went here and we wanted to do the expression pedal to a whammy, well, all we got to do is literally just bring up a whammy effect. And so I could go down and then we'll go to pitch and then pitch wham and then I'll assign that and so what we can do is the position I can just push and hold that parameter for three seconds or so and then you press learn and then you move the expression pedal I'm gonna press home to go back to home and then now we can see that that whammy pedal is being controlled by the expression pedal and so um, now I could turn it on and off by doing so or what I can do is I could even go in and do bypass control and then learn and then push down on the toe switch and then now we are off, now we are on. And so what I would have to do is just tell it to, you know, the, the opposite on turning that off like that and then we will just remove this out of the equation and so on and so forth. And so now we could turn that on and move our positioning and we're good to go. And so to just kind of get rid of this guy here, I would just, uh, you know, to take away the assignment here, we would just go to bypass control, expression toe switch, and then turn that to none. So now when I turn on my, and then we'll turn this like that. So pretty much what you have to do is whatever gets turned on, at the same time, you have to tell it to turn off. So my volume is off, so now I'm not controlling volume, I'm only controlling the pitch wham. Now my pitch wham is off, and it is not being controlled, but my volume is going to be controlled. And so that's how we do that there. So to kind of bring up a new preset, if we were to take a look in Podgo Edit, how we can do that is literally just go and add a, a pitch, a pitch wham, and then I will open up that block there. And then what we can do is if you right click the name um, right here, the, or not the name, but the parameter, whatever parameter you want, I could even do mix if I wanted to. But if we do pedal position, we want to assign that to let's say expression two. And, um, and then as well, foot switch seven, that could you know, turn it on and off. But if we want to assign the bypass control, um, right now it's by snapshot bypass, but I could go to bypass assign and then expression toe. And so we can do that as well. And then we could turn that on and off. And then this guy right here for expression control, um, for bypass assign, I'll choose none. And then for position, I will choose none. So now I will just turn this off and then I'll never have to worry about it. And so right now I'll turn this guy off. And so all you have to do is kind of just tell the expression pedal um, what control you want it to be uh, controlled by. And so right now I have my pitch wham and that's how we do that. Sorry if I just kind of skipped over a little too quick, Jack. But um, that's how you would do that. What I love um, with any parameter in Podgo or Helix, you could literally, even the amp, um, I could just push down on a parameter for a couple seconds and I could manually put in what controller I want to, uh, to control that parameter, or I could just press learn. And I could push a foot switch, I can move the expression pedal, and now I'm gonna go home so we can look at the home screen. And now that drive control is being affected by the expression pedal. And so that's how you would assign the pitch wham to the expression pedal. Just make sure that when, um, you know that you turn off any controllers controlling anything you don't want controlled such as this uh, um, you know this Wawa so pretty much everything that's assigned to the Wawa you would just turn it over to the pitch wham 
So hope that helps, Jack. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Um, I believe next week we have the great Ross Bailey who will be um, giving us some great, uh, great advice in British. So we will see you guys later. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.